Well, while you're uh, sitting there, let's go ahead and uh, begin with a prayer. And I know those of you that are uh, listening in on the podcast, this class is uh, from glitches to glory. I'm going to go over Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7 as my text. And um, it's uh, we're at Pepperdine's Harbor, <clears throat> Pepperdine Bible Lectures, and the title for this year is No Other Jesus. And um, I'm Robert Perez. And... Uh, May the 4th be with you. This is Star Wars Day, okay, if you're aware of that. And um, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, pray. Dear God, bless us. Uh, bless these men and women that are here. Even the people that will listen on the either the podcast or the audio or my family members that are listening in tonight on this. So uh, bless us all. Uh, bless the other teachers that are teaching too. I know we have. Uh, it's hard to come out of a pandemic and coming back to Pepperdine over the years. Um, we have less people, but we pray that um, we will continue to be blessed. In Jesus' name, amen. So thank you for being here. And um, I don't know what I did, but in my nervousness in teaching the class, I forgot my notes, <laughs> or my sermon notes. So luckily, I send it to myself on the phone, and you can actually, I have it on here. So that's pretty cool now. You can send your thing, and you can actually see it. So I'd like to start off with... Um, this slide, let's see if I could go, okay, just a reading, okay, this is our text, this is our text that we use to uh, basically to defend the eldership, our fourfold process of nominating, uh, um, introspecting, objecting, and confirming, and I got it from this test, text, you know, you've heard this, the democratic principle, so let's just read it together, those of you online, I'm reading from Acts chapter 6, 1 through 7 from the NIV, so here it is, Read along with me. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained against the Hebraic Jews because their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution of food. So the twelve gathered all the disciples together and said, It would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait on tables. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them and will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. And I love this. This proposal pleased the whole group, the church. They chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, also Philip, Procurus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Parmenas, that was a tough one, Nicholas from Antioch, a convert to Judaism. And then here's the confirmation. They presented these men to the apostles who prayed and laid their hands on them. And the last one, so the word of God spread, was blessed. So I want you to remember four words. Chose, choose, presented and prayed are together and blessed. That's the process. So, in a bold and trusting move, the apostles did not appoint the men themselves. They asked the church to do that. So one more time, in a bold and trusting move, the apostles did not appoint the men themselves. They asked the church to do that. And why was that such a bold and trusting move? Because it was a bold and trusting move because what we have here is... You have to trust in someone other than yourselves. And that was bold and trusting because if you think about the apostles' task here in chapter 6, the first time they were brought up with this discussion of relinquishing power or letting go of power, they failed miserably. miserably. They were arguing the night before Jesus died, these same apostles, what? Who was the greatest? And Jesus was trying to get them to get ready to transfer power from heaven onto earth and to these men. And they're sitting there arguing who's the greatest in Luke chapter 22. So I want you to think about it. It was bold and trusting because they weren't ready to let go. And that's what we came up with in Santa Paula. Am I, as a preacher that's been there 16, 17 years, ready to let go? And that seems to be a big problem, not just in a local church where Hispanic leaders tend to plant the church. They become the leader. And to finally appoint elders, you're tested. Are you going to let go? That's a worldwide problem. What I'm learning happens in churches in India and some of the African-American churches. To finally get to the point where are you willing to let go, these are, that's the same dilemma that the apostles had. 
The kings of the Gentiles lorded over them. Those who exercise authority over them call themselves benefactors. But you are not to be like that. Instead, the greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one greatest among you should be like the youngest, and the one who rules like the one who serves. For who is greater? And this is a rhetorical question. And you know the answer. Jesus knew the answer, and they knew the answer. It was ingrained in them in Israel to know that the most powerful and the elites, they were the ones in charge. So Jesus asked this question rhetorically. Who is greater? The one who is at the table or the one who serves? And we know the answer. It's the one who's at the table. It's the powerful, the elite. But Jesus turns it around, the upside down kingdom, and he says, but I am among you as one who serves. You are those who have stood by me in my trials, and I confer on you the kingdom just as my father conferred one on me so that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on the thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And then he tells Peter, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as weak, but I have prayed for you. And when you return, strengthen your brethren. Well, this text that I chose in Acts chapter 6 is a fulfillment of that scripture. Do you realize that? Now it's their chance, finally, to let go. And are they going to do it? And we know the answer, but it didn't happen easy. It didn't happen overnight. They had to witness Jesus get brutally tortured on the cross. They hid. He was resurrected. He went and searched them out. He found them, encouraged them. A Pentecost occurred. The Holy Spirit came upon them, and they were still scared. Peter got up and spoke. 3,000 were added. And then the church, they're put in the position, in the position now is Jesus. And I think what happened is what happened to us in the Santa Paula Church of Christ is that going through persecution and being in a position of being cornered, just like Jesus was at the trial, how had them rise up to the leadership. So I, what I'd like to do is, in order to get back to that text, let's go over a little bit um, what happened, what led them to the point of finally getting to the point of being able to let go and trust in this bold and trusting move and allow others to share that responsibility. Back in chapter 3 of the book of Acts, right after the Pentecost, right? It says everyone broke bread. They were gathering together. You know that text in Acts 2.42. And then in verse 2.47, it says they were praising God, enjoying the favor of all the people, and the Lord added to their number daily. And the first scene happens right here at this gate called Beautiful. And I was thinking, I went to Israel a couple of years or three years ago with Dr. Hufford. He's sitting right here. And when in my mind the gate called Beautiful was, I thought it was by the Dung Gate today. By the way, you get it when you get into the Wailing Wall. That's in my mind I thought it was. But then I looked up this. The beautiful gate was right behind the Golden Gate. Remember, Jesus went entered through the Golden Gate. He went down from uh, Bethphage. He went on the donkey. He probably got off one of these steps where the yellow or the orange arrow is. And at Beautiful Gate, it says Peter was making their way to the Temple of Solomon's Colonnade in chapter 3 of the book of Acts. And every day there was a group of people bring in a man that was lame from birth to the temple. And he used to sit there. They would bring him to the temple or the beautiful gate, and he would bathe. Well, as they were doing that, he saw Peter and John by the temples, you know, getting ready to preach. And he looked at him, and uh, the story goes that Peter saw him, and uh, Peter got their attention. And when the man looked at him and Peter got his attention, or the man got Peter's attention, the man expected to get some money from them. And Peter gives him that great response that we all know. Silver and gold I have none. But what I have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And I love the text after that. You know what happens to him? And this is what I wish happened to me as I get older. Last night I had a bad night sleeping. My neck hurts. I have arthritis. It says right here that the man became strong. His ankles and his feet and everything in him, his whatever it was, he became strong physically. And he was able to jump up and it got the people's attention and everyone ran to him. They ran to the man because they recognized this was the man 40 years had been in this condition. They saw that. So what they do is they run and surround the apostles, John and Peter. 
And Peter says, hey, it's because of Jesus of Nazareth that this man was healed. So remember, I'm getting to that point of bold and trusting move. This is one of the first incidences that is happening in the temple scene. And this happened, and Peter gives a great speech. He gives a great sermon and saying it's because of Jesus of Nazareth. And the favorite part of my, this speech is in chapter 3, the last few verses, if you have your Bibles, in verse 24 of chapter 3, it says, Indeed, beginning with Samuel and the prophets. And I thought, who's Samuel? Well, Samuel was the one that anointed King David. And Eli was the one that basically raised up Samuel. And he was the one, remember, when he was in the temple and the Lord spoke to him. And he runs to Eli and he says, who, did you call me? He goes, I didn't call you. And then this happened three times. And the third time, Eli told him, when you sit there, just listen in and say, here I am. And then he, here I am. It's the same word that Isaiah got. Here I am, send me. Moses, Moses, it's the same words that when God spoke to Moses, here I am. Who have spoken, indeed, beginning with Samuel and all the prophets who have spoken and foretold these days, and you are heirs of the prophets and of the covenant God made with your fathers. He said to Abraham, through your offspring, all peoples on the earth will be blessed. When God raised up his servant, he sent him first to you to bless you. And I thought this was, he sent him to bless you. And notice how you get blessed. He says, so that you, by turning each of you from your wicked ways. There's no council culture in this text, right? A little bit terse. And he's asking the church members who were responsible, probably at Jesus' Passover, and probably yelling, crucify him. And he said, you, you have a chance. So this was the interesting part. Remember I said in the bold and trusting move, what happens next? Well, the next story is the Sanhedrin. They were disturbed, it says in verse 12, or verse 2 of chapter 4. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people and proclaiming uh, in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And then Peter gives another speech, and he tells them it's because of Jesus of Nazareth that this man is healed before you. And this famous quote, um, the stone the builders rejected has become this capstone, he says, and salvation is found in no one else other than the name of Jesus. And the Sanhedrin uh, withdrew. They called a meeting together, and what they did was they basically commanded them to not preach in the name of Jesus. They told them to stop. Last week when I was preparing this talk, I received this text, or this, I get these emails, and this is from American Family Association. Here's a football coach in Washington who is Christian. It's at a public school, and uh, right now it says, Dear Robert, the United States Supreme Court is hearing arguments today in a case involving a former football coach in Washington State. And this, I got this two weeks ago. All he did was, before the game, by himself, he would go out to the 50-yard line and pray. And what happened, people started noticing, his football players, and they would start to follow him out there. Well, he got fired for that. And the Supreme Court is hearing this right now. And I don't know what's going to happen, but it's, the church, too, was at a dilemma here. The Sanhedrin were putting pressure on the apostles not to preach in the name of Jesus. Or, so they had basically two options. And same thing with us as we were going through this process. There's points sometimes when we're fighting or not getting along with our process. Are we going to continue the process? Or are we simply going to give up and stop? And the key principle that gave these men and women the courage to continue on was the spiritual discipline of prayer and godly men and women to encourage him. Everett Hufford was someone there a few times I had called him, my wife. I felt like giving up a few times, and they gave me just step by step, what do you do? And obviously prayer was part of it. So the early church, if you look in chapter 4, they're put with this dilemma that this man is right now going through. Should they continue or were they going to stop? And I'm going to read that. On their release, to get out of prison, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said and when they heard this, they raised their voices together, and the first thing they do is they pray. They get on their knees. 
That gives people courage to get in tune with the will of God. That gives me courage as a minister in the church to get in tune and finally listen to relinquish say, God, I can't do it. I've been here 16, 17 years at this church. It's time to let go. It's hard to do that. When you're in an emotional state where you're just not thinking right and you say, we have to go forward. So they go forward and I love their prayer. Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. Why do the nations rage? They talk about, and they talk about the spiritual warfare, the battle of being persecuted and the battle what's going on. And think about, these are the Sanhedrin. This is the same cast of characters that killed Jesus, that tried Jesus. It was Ananias. He says that really clearly in verse 6. Uh, Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas. Familiar names? Those were the guys that tried Jesus and put him to death with the same group. And now they're persecuting the apostles, so they pray. Now consider their threats and enable your servants, and look what he says, to speak, to move on, to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand and heal, and perf- heal hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And after they prayed, they placed um, where they were meeting, the place where they were meeting was shaking, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. And this is when Barnabas comes into the picture. He was a Levite. He heard about this movement. He comes to Jerusalem and he lays money at the feet of the apostles and gives everything. And then there's an interesting story that happens next. And I'm leading up to chapter six. What happens next? It seems like an outlier. It's the story of Annas, Ananias, and Sapphira. And you know what happened to them? They were cheating. It was the first church discipline issue. And they had to deal with it directly. And God would have none of it. And you know what happened to them? That seems like an outlier, but think about the church leaders that are, the baptized believers are seeing, hey, these leaders are doing the right thing. People were watching us as we were going through this process. So the apostles continued to preach, and then it doesn't stop there. They continue to be persecuted. And I don't want to go too much, but what I, I was looking up in the Bible project, Tim Mackey's Bible project, and what he said here is what you have is a tale of two temples. You got the Sanhedrin on the, one t- on the one side who were hoarding the power and wouldn't, wouldn't be willing to let go. They were jealous. It disturbed them. At one point it says in chapter 5, verse 33, they were so furious they wanted to put these men to death. But Gamaliel steps in and says, wait a second, we better wait and see what God does. So the Sanhedrin should have been doing what the Torah had said that you should do to the poor and the outcasts from Deuteronomy 14 and 15. And when I read that, it gave me hope. It talks about foreigners, it talks about orphans, it talks about people on the outside coming into the kingdom. And that was the duty. They were supposed to manage the temple by the practice of Deuteronomy 14 and 15. And the new temple, it was now the apostles who were the true leaders of Israel. So in Dan Bouchel's book, I read it this morning, I told him I read his book on the book of Acts. And he had one great statement in there to talk about this. And this is what was at stake. What we have here is a power struggle over leadership. And I want you to think as we're getting to Acts chapter 6 of God's people. Luke points out it was now the apostles who were the true leaders, spiritual leaders of Israel. Not the official leaders in the Sanhedrin. The apostles are now put into the same position as the Sanhedrin. Think about it. They're now the true leaders, and how are they going to react? Are they going to be like Jesus who taught them to be servants and not lord over the Gentiles? Are they going to continue to practice the way the temple is being run and hoard the leadership? And that's the temptation that really siphoned me. You know, it's easy to talk about appointing elders until you get to the point of actually doing it. And I remember we were going through, we nominated them in, and I put my nomination for them, and then you confirm them. And I had my hard time saying, am I going to pick these men? Because you know what? They may not be. And I had to think through that, letting go and trusting. And this is what God says to do, amen? So this was, they were in the same position as the Sanhedrin. What would they do? 
while they did what Jesus taught them. A fulfillment of Luke chapter 22, 28 through 30. So read it from that point of view. Let's reread it again, and I'll give you four points. In those days when the number of disciples was increasing, the Hellenistic Jews among them complained. Think about they complained. When I did this, I, when I read this text now that I understand going through ministry, you know what I thought of when I saw this first complaint? I thought of what happens to me in dealing with crisis in church. I grew up in East LA. I don't handle crisis as great. This is why we need elders. But what popped in my mind as I read this, when they heard the complaint, I would, this is my rendition of what I think might have went through a couple of the apostles. Are you for real? <laughs> Do you realize that we just got thrown in jail, we're being persecuted, and you're complaining about food right now? But they didn't do that. What they practice is what I learned in the grad school, a non-anxious presence. This is the power of Jesus coming through them. One little last illustration is, those of you who don't know, I played baseball here. And I went obviously down to the baseball field. And one of the things that the coach used to tell us all the time when we were facing a 90 mile an hour fastball pitcher, I want you guys to relax, he would tell us. And we would yell back, we are relaxed. How do you relax when a guy's throwing 90 miles an hour? Or when someone tells me, I remember I went to play golf a couple weeks ago, and the guy, hey, Perez, you need to relax, not swing so hard. I told him, that's a sin. You don't tell someone that plays baseball this ease up, and the guy's not a Christian. He goes, man, I never heard that. <laughs> so anyways, Kenny was with me. But anyways, think about that. The apostles are put in the position. Are they going to relinquish power? So I thought this, I wanted you to understand emotionally, this affected them too. And I thought they made a greatest decision. It was a wise decision. And they relinquished their power. So one writer, before I go on, one writer said this, a commentator said this, the apostles, this is verse 12. So the apostles, so the 12, remember these are the 12, Matthias gathered all the disciples. It's the whole church all the disciples together and said it would not be right for us to neglect the ministry of the word in order to wait and stay and table. So this can be interpreted as not caring for the poor. So here's what one commentator stated on this. The apostles designate seven to be deacons. And in this case, we use this for elders. Okay, this was our text to appoint elders. Not because the 12 are too self-important to work the food line, but rather because feeding, and this hits me hard, We have a lot of older people in our church, a lot of widows. Thank you, Everett, for teaching me very young to visit Brother Mac from Montebello. <clears throat> but rather because feeding the widows is too important a task for the distracted, overworked, teaching and preaching apostles to do it poorly. And instead of reacting, they transferred their God-given spiritual authority over to trusting men. Powerful text. Do you get that? Do you see the emotion? And that, that, wasn't, that was hard for them. They could have reacted like the Sanhedrin and hoarded the power. And here's the only imperative in the text. These are my four points. Choose. It's an imperative. Second person plural. It's telling the whole church. This is the principle we use. It's called the democratic church principle, if you read who runs the church. And the democratic church principle is the principle where the church has the authority or the God-given responsibility to elect its own officers. And that was challenged in our church. What about Barnabas and Paul who went around pointing elders? And someone, one of the guys, remember, Kenny, I think, told me, you need to plant. You need to, and they were putting pressure on me, and I thought of, putting pressure on me to plant, or not to plant, but to appoint the elders. And I said, well, 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22 says, be wary of who you lay your hands on. Don't do it too quickly, or don't show favoritism. So I felt in a church that hadn't had elders in 30 years that the best process for us to be involved is to get the whole church involved. And that was, in a cross-cultural church, that was important. No one could point fingers at one person saying, well, you appointed this guy. And I said, hey, God appointed them. This was the God-given process that we all decided upon. 
So brothers and sisters, choose, that's the first point, choose seven men. And we went over this test, text a few times in our leadership meeting, Dry Camp. We went over this over and over again, and we finally had to propose it. Are we going to use this model, or are we going to use the Acts 14, 23 model? And we all decided this is the model we're using. Choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom, and that's criteria, the choosing. You know, this word choose is also mentioned in 123 through 26, when uh, Matthias is taken over, and the word for choose is nominated. Notice in 123 it says, so they nominated two men. It's the word choose, it means to elect, it means to select, to discern. And not just anybody, people that are full of the spirit and wisdom. And they chose these men, and we will give our attention to prayer and ministry of the word. And uh, I love this part. This proposal pleased the whole group. And I think it pleased the whole group because they were included in the process. You know, um, when we went through the process, we did the four phases. We did the nomination phase where... We asked the whole church to nominate men from our church that they felt were full of the spirit and wisdom. And six names popped up. We used the 25 percentile criteria that if your name was mentioned at least 25 percent of the times, and six names was meant popped up. And uh, so I think the church felt blessed to be part of that process. And we had to defend that. And then, notice it says they chose Stephen, and here at seven, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit, and we know what happened to Stephen right after that. He gets stoned to death. He's the first martyr in the church. Not counting John or Jesus, but he's the first martyr. And then Philip's the evangelist. He's mentioned all the way in Acts with four daughters who prophesy, and he's in Caesarea. So these men were not just waiting on tables. They were spiritual leaders in the early church. So... They presented these men to the apostles, and the apostles prayed and laid their hands on them. He confirmed them. And the word of God spread, and a number of the disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient to the faith. Some of those men that were persecuting the apostles had to have believed, and this is how they know this story. So here's what I'd like to share. Um, in a bold and trusting move, we at the Santa Paula Church of Christ, we started this process in 2013. Um, it got to a, I did my doctoral dis dissertation under the uh, chairmanship of Dr. Hufford, he's sitting right here. And uh, we had to back off appointing elders and decide to generate trust between two ethnic groups for the future and growth of the whole church before we appointed elders. And I remember when I went into that meeting and told them in, we're backing off appointing elders. And oh, was that a six month leadership backlash. Well, we need to do it this, we need to do it in 2017. And we need, and it was just pressure, pressure. And I said, no, we're backing off. And I was stubborn. And I think behind it, really, to be honest, as I looked through it, I didn't really want to let go, part of it. So when you go through the whole process, and you get to the point of doing my dissertation and getting it all done and we generated trust and then now we're appointing elders. We're back at the same situation. And are we going to do it? And what happened was our, our group of men who said they wanted to do it really didn't want to do it. That was a big problem. So here are the three glitches. I made the mistake of copying. This is my first time going through the process copying two other churches that did this four-phase process. You know, the nomination, you've heard of that. Then you introspect, you know, you give these men, I gave them five questions, you know. Um, I copied it from another church. And then um, I made the mistake of what another church did. It says, okay, you're going to have to have a managerial team in charge of this process. And I was part of it, the two preachers and one man representing each of the two congregations or two language groups in our church. We have a Spanish and English group. Well, in that, I said, these men probably should not desire to be an elder. And I just said it, you know, haphazardly, not thinking about it. Well, that statement came back to bite me because I got nominated and so did another guy on the committee got nominated. And a couple of the men brought out this little memo that you said back in 2019 that anyone on this committee should not be an elder. And I said, well, I changed my mind. <laughs> And, I, and you should bless me. And he just, he goes, well, then you don't have integrity because First Timothy chapter 3 says you have to be above reproach. And I said, I accept your criticism. 
but I'm not going to make the decision because of you. I'm going to make the decision because God selected me, and I'll let you know Sunday. So my first point is don't eliminate your best candidates before one begins the process. And here I was, this is my personal rendition, here I was selected as an elder. But the real reason I knew I couldn't be an elder because I felt I was going to do the same thing that the Sanhedrin was doing. Put the preacher in power, and I'm going to still be leading the church and having all the stress. And it was time, and I remember I talked to my mentor, and he goes, what are you going to do? And I told him, I said, I'm going to do what my mentor taught me. I'm going to let the others lead. That was hard. But it's the right thing to do in my case. So don't eliminate your best candidates before one begins the process. We have a small church, and sometimes it may be the preacher. It may be men on the committee. So if you ever do this in your church, don't do that. In a big church, you have a gene pool that's big. Like in Memphis, Tennessee, they have big churches, elders, people that grow up in our church. It was small, right, Ken? Our gene pool went from 20 guys on this leadership team down to 12. And within that, think about it, if you eliminate four of them, then you have eight left. And then you have other issues. And then before you know it, we're eliminating everyone. The checkoff list, it just got to the point where we can only have three left. And then they want to eliminate them. So it got to that point. So that was my first glitch. Um, the objection phase and confirmation phase, phase had to be redone. I copied that from another church too. And the objection phase was... Um, if you have an objection with someone before voting no, you are to go face to face and directly talk to that person. You know that. It says it in scripture. Well, not one person in our church did that, and a lot of people voted no. So what do you do? So we had to confront that issue, have a new meeting and saying, hey, all you guys that voted no, you were supposed to do that. Why didn't you do that? We're going to throw out all the votes. And that would have divided the church. And thank God I found an off-ramp. Our nomination forms had a little glitch in it, or our final confirmation forms, and it says, please vote for one candidate only. And it had three names on it. So guess what 10 people did? They voted for one candidate, the first name on it only. And Kenny got the most votes, <laughs> sorry, because he was the first name on the list, and the other ones left the other ones blank. And as a result, by default, the ones that weren't mentioned had to be voted no. And this was our off-ramp to the men. And I said, look at these 10 forms. We have to redo the process. So that was a way to save face, because really there were some other issues behind it, why they didn't want to do it. And I showed them this. I said, we have to redo it. So that was the way we presented to the whole church and say, hey, we have to redo the objection phase. But we did it differently. No one wanted to do a letter and have them visit the people face to face. No one wanted to do it. And then I remembered a church in 1985 that went through elderships, a process like this. It was at Montebello Church of Christ. And what they did is what I proposed to the men. Why don't we just get the three candidates, like the Supreme Court nominees, take them before the whole church, have them sit in front and say, here they are. If you have an objection, tell them, and we could give them a chance to rebuttal the options or the positions. And that worked beautifully. It was a chance. I was worried. Every single person, our, our church was filled that day, 55 members. And then after we did that, we did that for about an hour and 15 minutes. And immediately, we cast the votes. It was our form of casting the lots, is what I say. We had a nomination form. We did that. We went and counted. And within 20 minutes, we came back and said, Two of the three men are elders, and the church applauded. And it gives me the chills to say that. <clears throat> you remember that, Ken? And a 70% criteria needs to seriously be rethought out. I don't know if you heard that, the confirmation, I just copied it from another church. And jokingly, one of my brothers said, <laughs> not even Jesus can make an elder at your church with that criteria. So anyways... That really, and especially in a cross-cultural setting, you filibuster the whole process. And I didn't realize that till after. That's why we had to redo it. But to let you know, we had to keep with that criteria the second time around to avoid, I think, a split. Because I was in the meeting, and I was ready to say, but let's change it to majority. And something inside me, the Holy Spirit says, Bob, just let it go. So the first time we did it, we only had one candidate that made it as an elder. The second time, two made it, and one didn't. 
So those are the three glitches. And the glory is the objective phase worked beautifully, this face-to-face -face thing in a small church. The confirmation phase redone worked even better. We were do, able to do it within 20 minutes. And as a preacher, I did not look at one form because I didn't want to look at the people that voted no and then preach some sermons against them the next week. I said, I'm not looking at them. And they tried to force me in the room. You need to look at them. I go, no, 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 you look at them. I'll just tell you because I know myself. I'm Uncle Fester. I'll say, ooh, I got a sermon ready for this. And you don't want to do that. But I had to do it the first time around because I felt there was something wrong. And I looked at all the forms and I was the one that caught the 10 people who voted for one candidate. And when I saw that, I was able to convince all the men to redo it because of that off ramp. Last thing, the result is two elders. Look at that picture. Ken Airy, one of our elders. And uh, Ramon Castillo, there's his wife Patty, and uh, Gloria is Ken's wife. So that's my you, class. I think you're real elder of the two women. <laughs> Don't say that at Pepperdine, sorry. <laughs> <laughs>